If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This is another of our popular Listener's Choice interviews, which we're playing over the weekend. We've chosen the most popular interviews for you to select the Listener's Choice winner. If you're not sure how the Listener's Choice competition works, have a look at horsechats.com slash choice for the rules and the leaderboard. Hey, it's Glennis here. Just to let you know that even though the quality in this audio isn't first rate, the information certainly is. Please excuse the audio quality and focus on the education and what you'll learn in this interview. If you have the same vision as International Horse College, which is to have a world where people safely appreciate, respect and enjoy their horses, and the horses appreciate, respect and enjoy their people, then have a look at their website, internationalhorsecollege.com, registered training organisation 31352. Our guest today is Max Pierce. For those who don't know Max as a carriage driver extraordinaire, just go back to Horse Chats number 044 or just go to Horse Chats and search for Maxwell, search for Max or search for Pierce and his name will come up. You'll be able to read all about him and listen to his previous interview. How are you today, Max? I'm well, Glennis, and how are you? (laughs) I'm very well. Max, today we're going to talk about the 10 things most people don't know about authentic and modern horse-drawn carriages. Is that right? That's right. It's quite an interesting subject. Yes, yes, and I'm sure that it's changed quite a lot from 100 years ago for to today. And I think your first point is the comparison between the coach builder 100 years ago and the modern coach builder. And you're going to talk about carriage parts, different trades, etc. So I'll leave you to go ahead, Max, and tell us all about that. Okay. Yes, uh, the, the coach builder 100 years ago um, was quite interesting as most towns had had uh, coach builders and, and quite a few in, in, in towns. So it was you know competition like it is today back then where the, the, the modern mechanical car dealer today has different outlets and you can go and get your car service. So back in those days, um, it was very similar. Where people had to get coaches built or carriages built, um, uh, horse-drawn vehicles built, um, all sorts of carriages like commercial vehicles and just transport vehicles. And, and those days, these guys used to either make their make their own parts. I think originally the coach built in Australia made a lot of their own own parts, so blacksmithing and, and timber timber works. They had their painters and stripers and pinstripers and upholsterers. So they had different trades within within their, their businesses. Um, my family, B, uh, um, had, had two coach works, coach building works, and they were on the Pierce side, S.H. Pierce and Sons had a very big factory. Um, and on my mother's side, the Hagues also had a, a factory. And um, there were many others in B at the same time. There were one and brothers, and I can't remember the others, but they were, they were, they were quite um, well known around the area. And uh, it was really interesting to see um, you know, some of those old carriages from that area um, pop up from time to time. Um, looking at the modern coach builder these days, there's not many around, by the way. There's only a handful of people that, that, um, that build ca- um, carriages. And uh, they, a, lot of, a lot of our carriages come in from overseas, are, are imported. They have a lot of vehicles coming from Poland, um, England, uh, America, um, and also a lot of Chinese carriages these days. And there's heaps and heaps, and it's unbelievable the amount of carriages that are, that are imported in the country. Um, there's only a handful of people building carriages here, authentic type um, and, and modern type. Yeah. Um, but, um, but it still is carried on. A lot of the methods are still used, the old methods are used on the authentic carriages, a lot of the old tools are still used. Um, but these people are very few and far between these days. As far as the parts go, years ago, the uh, they used to import most of the, the parts from America. The, co- the, the, um, the coach builder from 100 years ago used to import uh, lots and lots and lots of parts, um, American hickory shafts and uh, seat components and a lot of timber components, all the metalwork, 
springs um, fitting just the general the general hardware. Um, so that was very common. But once coast building really got going, um, there it was very common that they actually bought the components and assembled them and completed the carriage here in in Australia. Mm-hmm. What about the trades? You know that you said um, there's a few different trades. Is there a trade now as a carriage builder, a coach builder? It's funny you say that. Um, the coach builder continued on after uh, carriages, horse or vehicles were, were, were made. Mm-hmm. They moved, but they mainly moved into building coaches like train coaches. Oh, okay. Um, and, yes. And, yes. And buses. So those guys, they kept that name, a coach builder. Mm-hmm. But I'm not sure now. I think things may have changed in that area, but I know that they went from you know building horse-drawn carriages um, all those years ago, going going into into motor and, and, and train type type carriages. And some of those trades will still use you know paint and yeah. timber work and big in, in, in old trains and old buses and things. Mm-hmm. Tell us a bit then, and this is the next thing about. The collections and the types of the various antique carriages. Okay, um, there's quite a few collections around the country. Um, you don't hear them very often, but but there are many collections, and they pop up from time to time. And it sometimes amazes me that you know some people have got you know so many carriages stored away. Um, there's been some museums set up. They they seem to come and go. Um, you know, people had um, horse and vehicle museums, but they seem to be as not as popular as they used to be. And uh, and you know, the, the the collections can vary. You know, from more commercial type vehicles um, down to just transport type vehicles, so just general use. You know, church going carriages, buggies, sulkies. Sulkies were very very popular here in here in Australia. Um, there were years ago. There were lots and lots of coaches, you know, fairly big coaches, but they are very, very few and far between these days. There's, there wouldn't be too many type um, park brand coaches or, or, um, or English um, type coaches here in this country. I'd probably, you know, they'd probably be like it'd be five or six. That probably I know of even 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 that may be over over exaggerating. But then um, my collection, um, I've got a couple of Landos, a, a square Lando, a Shelbourne Lando, which is a carriage where you transport people and usually dignitaries, so people have a little bit of money. I sure was going to ask you about that because we know from a um, previous episode that we've got sort of the, in competition, we've got the single horse, the pairs, the fours, but, you know, a sulky, is that one horse? Or, or tell me the difference. How many yes. horses draw the different types of carriages? Yeah, a sulky is normally one horse. They'd, sometimes they had a pole sulky where they could put two horses in a in a in a sulky, and they had a, instead of having a shaft, they had a pole. Mm-hmm. But they were few up between two. But you know, mostly a sulky just had one horse pulling yes. it, or um, in some cases a tandem, so they could put a horse out in front. Um, and uh, was very commonly uh, used this combination. A tandem was very commonly used in England for the hunt or, or um, you know, if someone wanted to have a riding horse, put their riding horse out front and drive the sulky and actually drive that, that riding horse in front of the, uh, the horse pulling the, pulling the sulky or the, or the geek. Yes. Um, and um, in some cases in heavier um, situations where they had, a, a say, a dray, commercial work, they, they may have had a tandem pulling um, in front of the, 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 main, the main horse pulling the, um, the dray because, um, you know, they just expect horsepower, especially in hilly areas. Okay. Yep, that makes sense. Now, these collections, are they, they're mainly private, you said? They're mostly private collections. Uh, you know, there's a few museums around that. The Powerhouse Museum has, has a, a collection. Uh, I think they're mostly, I haven't, I haven't got to see their, their collection, but they're mostly actually stored away. Um, I, I have some friends that, have actually seen them. Um, they, they have a few on display in their museum, yep. and uh, and I think you know around the country, um, you know Adelaide and, and um, Victoria. I think there are different different displays in in different major museums. Yeah. Um, well, there's one in Canberra. I think there's a couple of carriages in the in the, in the Canberra Museum. 
Um, but it's not a big big thing these days. I, I remember going to museums, you know, there was one in Bansdale, a fairly big one that closed down uh, years ago, um, and there were some fairly big collections, but they seem to disappear. Um, I think they're still around, but they're just in other private collect- collections these days. All right. Now, if someone gets one of these old carriages, you know, because they could say, well, there's been one in the shed and my grandfather used to have it or his grandfather or, you know, whoever, the restoration of carriages. Tell us a bit about that. This is the third point about the preparation, painting, colours, the type of lining. If you can tell us a bit about that, it'd be really good. Okay. Um, yeah, there are, there, are, there are quite a few people actually who restore carriages in Australia. Um, it's a sort of very specialised field and there are a few um, um, quite a few people actually do just do it themselves. I've, I've, I've actually dabbled in this myself in restoring carriages. I've had, had some restored by experts. Um, so, and there is a way that they they restored these carriages or actually when they recently painted carriages and prepared them for, for sale, um, it was a really big thing in, in preparing the, the timber work and the metal work uh, for paint. And, um, and so, you know, these days, really the proper way to do it is to actually dismantle the carriage completely. Um, you know, replace all the, the timber work that may be rotting, um, have the wheels um, checked and, and re, reset if necessary or re-spoked and, or re Um Some characters back in sort of, as they develop, they, they, they put a hard rubber tyre on, on a lot of carriages to actually take the noise away from the road, um, the old steel line tyres. Yeah. Um, and that was a late probably more after the 1900s they developed this rubber, hard, hard black rubber that fitted in the channel on the wheels. Um, and um, but probably the biggest thing in, in rest- restoration is the preparation. Um, and um, I don't think a lot of people understand that, you know, you have to get a really good base coat, undercoat on the on that carriage and, and have it absolutely impeccably smooth before applying the finish coat. And they only really ever stuck to very traditional colours. And the the seat of a buggy or a, or a sulky and the floor of the tray part where you put your feet was always normally nearly, you know, 99% painted black. Um, and the dash. So the dash board and the floor and the seat was always normally painted black. And then the wheels, the springs, the shaft uh, were always a colour. So the colours were normally say, a, a very deep maroon, a very deep blue, um, a very deep green, and then or a, or a oaky yellow. And then they would actually then set the, 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 the really nice pin drops and aligning. Back in those days, they very, very well. I didn't really do any types of scrolls, you know, truck type scrolls that came in later, even though that fad developed um, here in Australia, but I think maybe been overseas as well, um, where they'd put a sort of a big scroll on the dashboard or a scroll on the back of the seat. Um, that was really never done originally. Um, mostly there was never any line work on the on the seat or the or the dash. Um, well, if there was a very fine line there, they didn't put very much line work in those areas, but they did decorate the springs, the shafts, and the wheels with lining, um, which really set the carriage off. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, to do with the restoration, and this brings us into the fourth point, the balance, because, you know, I've, I've heard of people just talking and they say it's just not well balanced, you know, the weight's wrong. And it's the same, yeah. you know, I suppose, with a with a horse float or a car or a truck. You've got to have the balance right. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, sure. The uh, the balance is very important, especially with a two wheel carriage with shaft. Um, and uh, when you're actually sitting in the carriage, um, the shaft should just be balancing in the tugs on the back saddle on the horse. So it's just a balance point, so that there's not too much weight on the on the horse's back. And then the, it's not tipping back and, and lifting up in the shaft, so it's actually lifting the horse up. So it's a very fine line in getting that balance right. And and, and lots of two wheel carriages had an adjustable seat, so you could actually ride the seat forward or one the seat back. 
And that dependent if you're carrying a passenger or just going, you know, one for yourself by yourself. So they had an adjustment there. Um, and the old coach builders had a, um, you know, they knew exactly where that happy medium was. Um, so, if, so if you were sitting in a carriage or two people sitting in a carriage and you wanted to check the balance, you would actually get someone to hold the shafts firmly um, and probably fetch them and then lift the carriage up and then find out where that balance point is. Um, so uh, that's a really good gauge to see whether your carriage is going to balance or not. It's basically tested before you put horse in. Lots of the um, modern carriages that are, that are built these days aren't balanced very well. They, they, they're heavy on, they're normally heavy on because they probably understand um, balance. And sometimes, I mean, I've tested a carriage, I've had one or two people in the carriage and I lift the shaft from the balance point maybe way above my head. So that gives you an idea how far out of balance the, the, the carriage is. So what happens is then is the horse is carrying a lot of weight and it can do damage to the horse's back um, in, um, in actually um, um, scalding the horse with a, on the, with the back saddle as it goes along, especially if it goes a long way. Um, short distance, you probably would notice it, but long distance, yes, you would. I've seen this happen. Um, so it's very, very important. The, the, the weights of carriages, there's a ratio, you know, in a really, really steep country, um, one to one. So if, say, the, the horse weighs 400 kilo, um, the, the, the carriage and the person's carrying, uh, the carriage shouldn't weigh more than 400 kilo. Um, so if, if you go the other way, one to two, so it could be, um, say the horse is 400 kilo, it could carry, it could carry uh, 800 kilo. And that's on um, very so, flat country, isn't it? That's on, that's on fairly easy going. Yep. Um, and then, and then if it's really, really easy going, like very flat all the way and it's not very far, you could go one to three. So okay. it just depends on, you know, like some, some horses carry, carried, you know, fairly big weights of, like in a, in a tip tray, for instance, um, loaded, loaded very heavily with sand or gravel or something. Um, so those horses, you know, carried a lot of weight, but they could only go on very easy going in country to be able to do that. So that's just a, a gauge on, on how, how you would actually work out how much a horse could pull. Now, what about the modern horse-drawn carriage? And we use that for, for competition, training, any sort of commercial use. Just tell us a bit about that and how it might have changed and what we're doing, I suppose, as a result of just technology and more knowledge. You know, are we making changes for the better or are the older carriages better? Um, yeah, the, these days... Um uh, for competition, of course, um, they, they're putting uh, disc brakes, four-wheel disc brakes on, on the carriages. Um, they're putting um, uh, delayed steering, so it's, a, it's quite a modern thing. Delayed steering means that when the horse turns, that the wheels aren't turning in line with the horse, so they wheel turn slower so that the car- carriage turns in more of an arc with the horse. Uh, yes. It's quite a, um, quite a new thing. Um, the modern horse carriage is getting better and better and uh, more of an understanding. Um, the modern foil carriage, the foil carriage today is actually very good on good horse because they're not carrying weight. And with these added additions with four wheel disc brakes, so they've got two wheel disc brakes and this blade steering mechanism. Um, and then they also have a, a turntable brake where it's actually deaden the, the, the or, or, or dampen. The, the way the vehicle turns, so instead of it, you know, the, the turntable turning quickly, you can actually make it slower and make the horse balance the vehicle better, so you don't get slip and slide. Yep. Um, so they've got all these modern, modern um, additions to carriages that I've never ever had before. You'd never ever dream, dream, hundred years ago, you'd never dream of these things, but, but they're certainly up there. And uh, the only thing that you know. Concerns me some of the, the original sort of two wheel steel carriages. Balance is a big thing, so if anyone's looking at two wheel carriage and it's a modern one, make sure that it's a balanced one and not one that's out of balance. Yeah. Um, because it is a problem. It can be a problem. But no, it's very very interesting. The modern modern carriage they use for competition work. 
in um, the, today with if it's, if it's competition driving, there's usually three, three sections that are driven dressage. There's a cross country marathon with obstacles, and then there's a cone, cone course. Uh, and um, so the, the rules say that you actually have a, a, a competition carried, which is a, a, a really nice, um, authentic looking carriage for your dressage and your cones. And you have a, a, a marathon carriage, which is like a battle, battle carriage for, for, for your marathon, which is um, a, a different weight, um, it's more compact, um, it'll negotiate the, the distance of bends quicker. Um, again, delayed steering, brakes, turntable brake. Um, so you, these days, sort of most people that are really fair in the car- competition driving will have two carriages. So they'll have a, co- a dressage carriage and I'll have a, a marathon carriage. Um, and there's different widths. There's rules and regulations for different widths for different for ponies and horses and teams. And so there's different widths of the carriages. So it all falls into a set of rules. Um, that govern the competition carriage driving. Okay. Now, just thinking now to do with the maintenance of these carriages, you know, is there a difference between the maintenance between the old carriages and the new carriages? Yes, yes, for sure um, there is. The old carriages, they were constantly, you know, they had lots and lots of use. So the wheels would get loose, um, the, the steel band or the, the, the channel on the rubber would come loose, and that's what kept the coach builders very, very busy and blacksmiths really busy. They were constantly doing wheel riding work in mm-hmm. fixing wheels um, and rubbering wheels in the, in the later, later years and um, and also um, keeping the axles maintained. So, you know, they were, most vehicles they didn't have bear, bearings in those, bore, bore ice bearings in those yes. days. They just had a, a steel box box that fits into the wooden hub of the wheel, and that was steel on steel. Um, but what they did have is a leather packer on the inside, and they had a leather packer on the in, inside the nut. And what happened is they, they governed the, the thickness of the leather, especially on the inside, um, with the grease to actually make that wheel spin freely that it just, when the nut was really tight. Um, and, and, and the wheel didn't wobble, um, that was the servicing of a, an antique carriage, and it's still the same today. And um, so there was lots of that work in greasing and packing the wheel, um, keeping the wheel um, maintained, keeping them tight, because if the steel band wasn't tight on the wheel, the wheel would fall apart. Um, and in this... Um, uh, Australian heat, um, lots of wheels shrank, so they shrank. So they shrank, it meant that the, the, the iron um, tyre came loose and then the wheel was, was weak and, and it, it wouldn't stand up to the, to the conditions they had, especially those days. Um, in the modern carriages, it's very much like servicing a car where, you know, they've got brake fluid to, to, um, uh, to keep the, the brakes serviced. Um, you've, you've got to take the brake fluid and make sure it's right. Uh, the brake linings, disc brakes, most of that disc, disc brakes these days. Some have drum brakes, but basically the same sort of thing as you're servicing your car. Um, some modern carriages have pneumatic tyres, so then again, just keeping the tyre pressure right. Um, in some competitions, they only have, or they may have steel wheels, but they're authentic type wheels with a hard rubber tyre. So, you know, that they need to be get checked. Um, and, uh, and just basically general maintenance of a, steel, of a, of a modern carriage is no, no fractures, steel fractures or anything like that. So so basically servicing a modern carriage is very similar to servicing a car these days without the motor. Now, going back to competitions, I know you've got this as, as number nine, but I think if we can talk about the different types of carriage driving events then we, if we, once we've got the different types established, then we can talk about the correct attire and the driving rules. Is that okay if we change those around? That's okay. Mm. That's mm. okay, yeah. So we've yeah. talked about marathon and dressage and cones, but, just, yeah, just tell us about the different types of carriage driving events and, and a little bit more about them. Okay. Um, well, the show driving events, um, you know, lots of egg shows throughout the country um, put on, on carriage driving events. 
And uh, so, you know, those events um, is basically they're broken up into into maybe turnout. So they're looking at judging the horse and the the harness, setting the horse, and then just all separately they sort of add add a, a, a score sheet up. The horse, the the the, um, the harness, the carriage, um, the um, general appearance, um, and um, it's all these points are added up. Um, so that's basically a turnout. That could be sort of heavy horses or, or medium horses or light horses. Um, in, um, in in competition driving, they um, in competition driving they have, as I said they have the different dress arts in the marathon and the cones. Um, so that's a set competition in in um, in in other areas. This is pleasure driving where people just go out for a pleasure drive and have the, you know a picnic stay. Um, and uh, so there's you know there's different types of driving um, it's, it's, they're probably the, the three most popular um, there's, there's, there's scurry driving where or indoor driving where they have a, a set course and, and, and you're, you're timed yep. um, so that's sort of fairly popular popular as well that'd be a good spectator sport wouldn't it the scurry driving yeah, it's a very, yeah we had one here in gold but just before christmas yeah fabulous a fabulous day yes um when we did this indoor and, and negotiated um, the cones, and then there were two obstacles in there. Um, that was a fantastic, fantastic day. So you know they're probably the most popular events. Um, and then there's people just want to go for a country ride around their property or on a country road. You know, they're so it's for their own own pleasure. Mm. Um, so you know, really, the world's your oyster with carriage driving. You know, if you just want to find out what what area you'd like, you know, a lot of people come to me and I get them. I start them off in coaching and showing how to harness up, and and they say, oh, no, I, I don't want to do any competition driving. I just want to just, just drive. I okay, just want to just drive down the road when I feel like it. You know, mm-hmm. most of those people end up end up doing some sort of show, showing or or competition work within twelve months. You know, they yeah. get the bug yeah. away they go. So that's that's really interesting. And I, I, when most people tell me, oh no, I don't want to. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. And now just to do with the next the next one, if we can talk a little bit about the carriage driving rules and then we'll talk about the correct attire. Um, there, there's a, a couple of organisations that have been in competition driving, FBI, you know, federation, international um, uh, mob in overseas, um, competition carries driving. Uh, it's a very big thing in Europe um, and in the UK and America. Um, and, you know, we here in Australia use basically, um, depending on which organisation, you're involved with, um, we basically use those rules to, you know, 100% use carry driving rules. And they're really set out in you know, all different areas of penalties and what you can do and what you can't do, what welfare, um, your attire, what you should wear, um, you know, the, the distances like you in show jumping where they've got special distances the horse can, can jump and turn and all the rest of it. Um, the, the carry driving rules really cover all that. Um, the size of arenas, and you name it, it's there. It's it's quite a big document. Um, then there are there are local rules. Um, there are that are you know club rules. Um, then there are national rules um, where they're slightly modified to suit people here in Australia. So Equestrian uh, Australia have um, a, a national um, carriage driving committee. Um, they basically govern you know, what happens here in Australia with without without national rules. And then there were clubs, there's, there's Equestrian Australia clubs, um, uh, ACDS, Australian Carriage Driving Society clubs, and they're throughout Australia. So there's a vast variety of opportunities for people to in the carriage driving. You know, there's other media like uh, Facebook, there's lots of different, you put car harness in, carriage in, um, 
driving, um, lots of sites will pop up where people can get, you know, I'm chat, chat, chatting with people and asking questions. Um, uh, there's all sorts of areas where people can get involved. Find at the rules. But the biggest thing is I always push with carriage driving is safety. Safety is just paramount. Um, yep. While in the carriage is not a pretty sight for, you know, the horse, um, the person driving and other people on the ground and um, and property. Um, so it's a really big thing. And, you know, I can always stress, I think I did in my last interview with you about this, And uh, but it's a really big thing. And some people like to just do it themselves and, and wing it, um, and most 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 time to get into get into the trouble. So, you know, whatever you do, get a coach to cut you off. That's my yes. that's my view. What about the uh, correct attire? You know, because we don't just turn out in our normal riding clothes. What's the correct attire for the different types of events? Okay, normally it's just um, sensible um, wear, like for a lady, you know, a nice. A jacket and a, and a skirt, and um, you know maybe maybe a, a scarf and a really nice hat. Um, this is maybe for presentation show, showing, um, and uh, and our classes are all factory driven dressage and cones. So it's very very similar. Whichever discipline you want to um, be in is what you wear, and you know just shorts and and just casual gear is really not acceptable even for training. People wear shorts driving. You know, I'm guilty of this sometimes around on the farm, but um, but, um, but normally just nice, nice for, for ladies, nice sports um, coat, um, business wear like a business type suit always looks really, really nice. The colours are more earthy. Um, you know, it could be creams or blues, royal blues, browns look good, um, fawn, all that those types of colours, um, um, yellow ochre colours really look nice. Um, sometimes a lot of people here wear black too much black, so they wear a black hat and a black jacket and black black um, um, skirt, so um, and it can be too much. So, you know, my view is is, is break it up a little bit. Um, a driving apron is normally central, um, and the driving apron um, used to be able to keep you know the the, and the horse flicking up on your clothes. Um, it can always act as being waterproof, so it keeps the water from from um, sticking in the lap. Um, it can also be used for for, for rains where you've got you know maybe some oil or something on the rains, so getting getting oil or or be polish or something on your clothes. So they were they were used traditionally in um, competition driving. It's a, it's a requirement. They must have, must have a uh, a whip, an apron, gloves, and a hat. Okay, um, and that. And you get penalised if you don't have those. But in show driving, it's it's, it's optional. But but the same the same um, rules normally apply um, for men. Just a, a, a good type of, um, a suit, you know, is normally nice um, a tweed jacket. Depending on the type of carriage you're driving and, and horse and harness you're using, um, that can be sort of mixed and matched. Again, a driving apron, a hat and gloves, and a whip um, is essential. The grooms, um, depending if it's a four in hand, a, a livery type um, gear is is um, is normally what's worn. For the grooms um, in single harness and pairs. Um, I mean, riding attire is also acceptable for for, for your groom. Just normal riding gear is, is normally acceptable too. Uh, and then again, just normal neat and tidy tidy um, wear is um, is acceptable. Um, so it just depends on what your turnout is, what competition you're going in. But generally, it's just neat and tidy, um, you know, suits for men, tweed jacket, um, a nice bit for a lady. Um, and, um, what about if people want to get involved? You talked a little bit before about Facebook and groups and, you know, you talked about the FBI yes. and, and different groups. But, you know, if someone doesn't know anyone and even if they're going to get on Facebook, what do they do? they search for somewhere or get online, search? It's very, I, I see it all the time. Um, you know, someone will put out a, on one of these sites and ask you how to get involved. I'm in this area and, you know, is there a club? Yep. Someone, you know, 99% of the time, someone will answer that very good, okay. immediately and actually give them instructions. So for anyone wanting to get into carriage driving, um, very, very easy to find out information. So mm-hmm. simple. Um, if, you, if you're online and you're on Facebook or just do a Google search, there are websites out there. 
Um, you know, there's diving societies out there. The uh, Question Australia is there. Um, and then they've got linkages to clubs and state branches and you name it. So very, very easy, you know, so people should not, not worry about that. It's and are you happy if find. people contact you, Max, if, um, if they, not, they're not, not sure? Is that okay? Not. Yeah, yeah. And, and what's the best thing, do you think, about getting involved with carriage driving? What do you think is the best thing? Well, probably if I think back, um, it's, number one, a great family activity or sport or or, or um, just a, a hobby um, where you can involve the whole family. Um, it's fantastic for children um, where they can, you know, come with you. You, you can pick up your horse, doesn't matter what combination, single pair or team or whatever. And everyone has to help because, you know, it's just not like taking a saddle and a bridle to a show. When you go, when you go to a carriage driving event, you've got a carriage, you've got a harness, you've got a horse or horses, um, and you've got all this gear. So you need help. So it's a great family activity. Um, the other thing is it's, it's, it's great to, to get other people involved and to, and to learn. And that's where I've uh, it fallen within my, my family. I've grown up now, but it's certainly um, my children, you know, develop themselves in meeting people and, and getting horse, you know, developing horsemanship skills. And um, and I never had a problem with the kids. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, but these days, I've got lots of people that come and help me, and, and we we do lots of things, you know, and they learn and help me. And so that's probably the, the best part. Mm. about it and you know seeing the horses go well training them well together yep. um you know it it's really a really a great a great thing um and, and a little bit different to some other equestrian sports a, a bit different where you know it's only one-on-one with the horse and the saddle um but with the, with carriage driving you certainly need some backup yeah yeah and as you say you know good good family good for kids and, and something a bit different yeah. And that's what I love. I, I just I love going to shows and having a great team of people yeah. beside yeah. me. Uh, yeah. And I, I I might take you know two or three people with carriages, and they, they might even be my horses and carriages, and we'll I'll drive and they'll drive, and so we we you know coach. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, and we, have, we have, normally have a ball. Normally yeah. have a, a good. Lot of fun. We just come back from Brisbane. We put nine horses to um to, to Brisbane Anzac Day and uh, put in the, the Anzac gun. Yes, and we um, put the six horse pavilion in, and we came right down through um, from Rose Street Parklands down into um, Adelaide Street in Brisbane, and the the, the traffic and the noise, and <laughs> everything was just you know people. Yeah. But you know, all those horses, we had six pavilion, and then the gun team, and we had three riders, and yeah. I actually rode. Um, and the horses didn't flinch, you know, just unbelievable. And you know, so the the training we did and the the, um, the teamwork we did just paid off. Yeah. That sounds wonderful. All right, Max, now if people would like to contact Max if they'd like to find out a bit more, like to find out about how to get involved or even if they just want a bit more information about some of the things we talked about because I think there was a lot of valuable information here that's not readily available. You know, I think Max has been involved with carriage driving for quite a long time, so a wealth of knowledge there. So thanks, Max, for coming on today and chatting to us about this. It's been really good, lots of information, and uh, for those people that like to catch up with Max, I'm sure that would be okay. So thank you again, Max. Thank you very much, Glennis. It's been lovely talking to you. Good to talk to you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. If you've enjoyed this chat, then please comment, rate, and subscribe. If you'd like any changes or recommendations for guests, then please contact us through horsechats.com. And while you're online, have a look at the government accredited courses at internationalhorsecollege.com. Registered Training Organisation 31352. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below.